Wow, here we are again. Another episode of Mr. W Live with none other than Mr. W himself. Because, like, to do the show without me, it would be somebody else live. And instead, it's me live. I um, hope everybody's doing okay out there in internet land and the land of other things. Um, I'm not actually ready to be, oh yeah, I'm not, no, it's not, there's a little bit of a, little bit of asynchronicity that goes on here with the internet. So sometimes I'm not seeing exactly what I think I'm seeing. I'm seeing five concurrent viewers and that is very, very exciting. Five people, possibly Matthew Diggins is here. And then somebody else who says, my name is Hey. Well, that's very exciting. Hey, hey, how are you? Um, and I've got Flora and Giotti. Everybody's checking in. That's so fantastic. Um, I hope everybody's doing well, well out there. Um, Emily Beckett is there. That's fantastic. Um, wow, it is just so great to have everybody here. Very, very exciting. Um, <clears throat> we've got a fantastic show lined up for today based on your requests. Um, we're going to do some extremely, extremely exciting things. Um, I've put together an agenda, but the first thing we should do is start with my new theme song because I love it so much. So let's just hear it. You can see some of the beautiful places where I live, where I do this show from. Daniel, very nice to have you here. And let's just see me on the beach. Oh no, that was the wrong thing to do. Here we are. Let's try that again. I got this. That's me. Wearing the same shirt. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2 p.m. PST. Your health, your birthday, key biology. There it is. This biomania system will help you to review. We'll show you how to write your FRQs. Ask Mr. W all your questions. He's live. We'll guide you to a form. Yeah, here we are at sciencemusicvideos.com, Mr. W Live Show, possibly the only place in the world where music and AP biology curriculum are strictly mixed together in the melange that creates a fabulous, fabulous amount of learning. What could be better? Music, biology, two of my favorite things. They're probably two of your favorite things, and that's probably why you came to the Mr. W live show. And here we are. So let's talk about what some of the things are that I've lined up for you today. No, that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was share with you today's agenda. So first thing is we're going to do a musical biology review of <clears throat> one of the most important processes in biology. You know, there's a thing that biology teachers say, which is that like you wouldn't be here. And that's true of like pretty much everything in biology. But this is particularly true in terms of you as an individual, in terms of who you are, how you got to have the particular genetic constitution that you have. It's all about the process of meiosis. So I'm going to show you a video, a music video of meiosis, and uh, we'll go through it. You can think of questions while you do there, and then we'll move on from that. Um, we'll do a quick practice FRQ of the day. Um, there was a student requested review from our last session about um, an incredible process called the Calvin cycle, the second part of photosynthesis. I'll run you through that. There was another student requested review for eukaryotic gene regulation. I'm going to do that, but I want to say that the intense details of eukaryotic gene regulation, I mean, I don't want to guess what's in the AP exam, but I can't imagine that there'll be a question about that because... It's just a very, very narrow topic, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about the key features, and then we'll have a biology quiz, and then that's going to be it. Um, so we got Sputnik, who is, I think, I think from France. Is that right? I, I, always, I always forget. It's fantastic. I hope everybody has said hi so far. I'm just going to do a little check here. 
All right, fantastic. And guys, I'm going to ask you to do this thing that I always ask you to do. I want you to take your phone. Take your phone right now. And uh, there you can sort of see my family from a distance. Um, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to invite five people to get here because, you know, it's just kind of fun. The idea that I'm doing this for 11 people around the world is fabulous. But the idea that I'd be doing it for 55 people around the world would be somehow more inspiring. And I know that like numbers aren't important in most cases, but it would be cool. It would be cool for me. Um, it would help me bring more energy to this endeavor. So uh, get out your phone, text a couple of friends, tell them to come on over to the Mr. W live show. I'm just going to look at the comments. I'm seeing GOT listen to the protein synthesis rap. That protein synthesis rap, it really does it. Um, and gene regulation from the college board, fantastic. Um, good, good. Everybody's doing pretty well here. So let's, uh, let's listen to meiosis. So I just want to show you something where it, we're going to, I'm going to play this off of the PowerPoint, but if you want to see the lyrics, um, just go to meiosis. So I have two versions of my video here. I got to fix that. It's a little problem on my website, but here are the lyrics right here. And again, in terms of reviewing content, the songs are pretty great. Many of the songs I have karaoke versions and for you to learn the karaoke versions of these songs, I mean, if you do that, you'll know all the details. Now, whether that will translate into better performance on the AP BioTest, I have no idea. This AP BioTest is quite a mystery. Two FRQs is really something. Um, I'm doing my best to prepare my students and by proxy, all of you who are the viewers on this show, encouraging you to do the College Board FRQs, uh, the FRQs on my Biomania app or on the website. Um, but, you know, it's just it's just really a mystery as to how that's going to go this year. Um, but. Let's do this. Um, I'm just going to play meiosis. I actually think I might get better performance if I do it from here. So let's go like this and meiosis. And here we go. You guys ready? Um, there's a, a little story behind this song, which is that um, the idea for this song came to me when I was in what's called the Ford Museum, which is, I believe, in Lansing, Michigan. My son went to University of Michigan. And I went to visit him one winter and we drove to the Ford Museum. And it's an amazing museum because they've got all of these like old cars and trucks and tractors and things like that. And they had like a jukebox where they talked about music that had been inspired by cars, which has some of my favorite songs like, uh, baby, you can drive my car. Anybody know who did that? Anybody know? Guess I'm gonna be a star. Baby, you can, no? Let's see, maybe it'll come up. But anyhow, they also had this song by Johnny Cash, the great country musician. And Johnny Cash um, wrote a song called One Piece at a Time, which is a really funny song about a guy who worked at a car factory. Um, and uh, that inspired the song Meiosis. So we're gonna play the song Meiosis, enjoy it. I see you guys are connecting with one another, chatting with one another. That's part of what we're doing. We're building the science music videos community. Whoever thought that that would be happening, let's go. Let's play Meiosis. Well, Max, you think you're ready for Meiosis? Ready for whose osis? Meiosis. Let me show you. Meiosis is how we make sex cells. Or gametes, the sperm cells, or egg cells performing the feat of moving genes forward in eukaryotes like orchids and bees. Meiosis doesn't happen in all cells of the body. There's just a few cells that have this hobby. I'm talking about germ cells and testes and ovaries. Germ cells are diploid, and what that means is that the chromosomes are paired up in teams. In each pair, one's from your dad, one's from your mother. When you line up the chromosomes, it's suddenly clear how each is a member of a couple's pair. Homologous pairs, each a homolog of the other. 
in humans, the diploid number is 46. And a key trick that happens in meiosis is dividing that number in half, 23. And that single set of chromosomes has its own name. It's called haploid in this meiotic game. So diploid to haploid is a key meiotic strategy. Meiosis makes eggs and sperm. It's the same in the robin as it is in the worm. Makes haploid gametes recombination. Meiosis creates variation. In interphase one, meiosis starts. It's the DNA replication part, an evolutionary relic of its origin. Cause meiosis evolved from mitosis, you see, so each process starts identically, replicating chromosomes into two sister chromatids. In prophase one, chromosomes coil up and homologous pairs pair up, forming tetrads, each with chromatids four. A chiasm is the spot where the chromatids link and synapsis is a name for the whole darn thing and crossing over is what this whole process is for. See, the homologs aren't identical twins. No way, they're not the same DNA. The genes are the same, but the alleles might take different forms. So during synapsis, alleles can cross over between homologs, and when it's all over, there are gene combinations that have never been seen before. Meiosis makes eggs and sperm. It's the same in the robin as it is in the worm. Makes haploid gametes recombination. Meiosis creates variation. Another biotic variety creator is metaphase one. This one with homologs at the equator, because how each pair lines up is random and independent. So in one pair face, the north might be the maternal, and the next one it might be the paternal. It's a one and two shot, it's called independent assortment. So two pairs divide up in four distinct ways. It's two to the number of pairs, you could say. So think about us humans with 23 homologous pairs. 2 to the 23rd power is a number so great, it's 8,388,608. That's why metaphase 1 is a variety creating a pair. And now connect this assortment with recombination. Note that what we've got during gamete creation is sperm and egg cells that are absolutely unique. So if you ever wondered why sisters or brothers can be so different from one another, just remember these meiotic recombining techniques. And if meiosis had never evolved, the book of life would be a very different tome. Cause if it wasn't for meiosis, all offspring would be clones. Metaphase one, homologs the equator. Anaphase one, they say, see you later. It's like mom and dad splitting up and setting up new home. Two nuclei form in telophase one, then cytokinesis, meiosis one is done. We've got two haploid daughters still with doubled chromosomes. Now, things are much simpler in part two of meiosis. Essentially, it's just like mitosis. You just need to pull those sister chromatids apart. They line up in the center in metaphase. Two anaphase pulls them apart. We're almost through. Telophase, then cytokinesis. We're at the last part. Okay, I'm going to continue it in a second. But what I want you to do is, while the rest of the song is playing, I'd like you to put any questions that you have about meiosis into the chat. And then I'll address them. So meiosis is a very, very important process, how it creates variation, what's going on in meiosis one during, during, as opposed to meiosis two, things like that. So think of questions about meiosis, put them in the chat so that by the time the song is done, there'll be a lot of questions, there won't be any hesitation, there won't be any waiting, and we can just go ahead and finish. So you've probably got about a minute. Let's get some questions in the chat about meiosis. Ah! Let's try that again. Let's do this. We were about here. There we go. Would be Questions in the chat about meiosis. Anaphase one, homologs the equator. Anaphase one, they say, see you later. It's like mom and dad splitting up and setting up new homes. Two nuclei form in telophase one, then cytokinesis, meiosis one is done. We've got two haploid daughters still with doubled chromosomes. Now things are much simpler in part two of meiosis. Essentially, it's just like mitosis. You just need to pull those sister chromatids apart. 
They line up in the center in metaphase two and a phase pulls them apart. We're almost through. Telophase then cytokinesis. We're at the last part. Meiosis makes egg and sperm. It's the same in the robin as it is in the worm. Makes haploid gamete recombination. Meiosis creates variation. Max, how do you think we did? You think they understand? They understand meiosis now? You know, I, I don't know why anyone would ever want to understand meiosis. Max, it's not eurosis, it's meiosis. Haven't you been listening to the song? I know it's not meiosis. That's why I said eurosis. Max, if you don't understand meiosis, you're never going to be able to pass your genes on. You know what? I'm going to keep my genes. Okay, fabulous. That's meiosis. Want to again give credit to my fabulous music producer, Max Cowan. Max is just a miracle man, an incredible musician. And uh, give you a little secret. I'm, I'm working on a song, at least one song that is going to be useful for review for the AP bio exam. Like I got the lyrics and I'm working it out. And it's miracle Max Cowan, who's going to create the the backing track for that or, or the underlying music. He's going to produce it. He's going to make it sound amazing because that's what he does. So we got a bunch of questions about meiosis. And um, let's see. Uh, the big point of meiosis is to make us all different because that is right. So Matthew, that is completely, completely correct. What meiosis does is it creates variation between parents and offspring, so it's intergenerational differences, and it also creates differences among offspring. So like, for example, as I, as I try to communicate in a song, meiosis is the reason why you and if you have a brother or a sister, why you're not identical, even though you know you have the same parents who are prov providing genetic material, but their genetic material gets mixed up as it gets passed to you, it gets reassorted, and this is a very, very important thing. You know how like mom, dad says to you, oh, you're so special. Well, it's true. You are special. You are a unique, unique being in the universe. And I'm not just talking about like here, wherever community you live in. In the entire universe, there has never been a creature like you. And that is because of meiosis. Meiosis creates unique DNA. That unique DNA unfolds itself in unique ways. You are a unique organization of matter that in the 14 billion year history of this universe has never been here before. And if you're ever feeling a little bit down and feeling like there's nothing special about you, you are indeed special. But don't let it go to your head either because everyone is just as special as you are. Okay, so um, Matthew, that's right. The point of meiosis is to create variation, though you got to be careful. We haven't really done the evolution part of the course or my kids have, but not everybody has. You know, evolution isn't really something that has a purpose. Um, meiosis evolved so that the creatures who were doing meiosis could survive themselves like it didn't. It, evolution has no foresight, but we're getting into some philosophy. We don't need to worry about that, too. So now we have a question from Hay. What is a homologous pair? Is it the same as a tetrad? Not exactly, but the two are very closely aligned. So um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump over here and here. Again, let's try to do this. Okay, so let's go here. And just so that you guys know, go to the AP Bio College menu on Science Music Videos. And then if you go to... Um, Meiosis, which is in Unit 5, Heredity, Meiosis, Sex, Determination. Okay, Meiosis, Basic Concepts, Meiosis 1 versus Meiosis 2. Let's see what's in here. And one thing that I want you to note, okay, so this is a karyotype. It's an utterly artificial kind of diagram. But basically, we humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. In each pair, one comes from the mother, one comes from the father. And in a diagram, in a picture like this, you can't tell which one. Just know that in each pair, one is a maternal, 
chromosome, one of motherly origin, and one is paternal, one of fatherly origin. So that's a homologous pair. Now, those pairs have the same type of information, but the information is not exactly the same. What I tell my students is it's kind of like you have a recipe book. You have volume 1A, volume 1B. You turn to the same page in that recipe book. You get the recipe for the same thing, tomato sauce, but that recipe is not exactly the same. So like, for example, in the one that you inherit from your mom, it might have more garlic. And in the one that you inherit from your dad, it might have more oregano, more basil, right? So same, same recipe, for, recipe for the same thing, but not exactly the same thing. And that's what, that's what homologous means. It's the same type of information. The information is not precisely the same thing. Now, during meiosis, tetrads form. And I wonder if I have a diagram here. I'm going to go on to the next. Let's see if this pops up. So let's see. Let's go to the next piece. Okay. This is a tetrad. So when homologous pairs pair up, they form a unit that consists of, this is going to sound confusing, but four chromatids, tetra, four. And so this thing with four chromatids, two from each homologous pair, that's a tetrad. And the tetrad, is, tetrad formation is connected to the process of synapsis. Synapsis is the homologous pairs coming together, forming tetrads. Then they exchange bits of DNA in the process that's called recombination. And that explains recombination that occurs during genetics. So let's see what other questions we had. Homologous pairs, just a pair of chromosomes. Got that question. GOT, endomyosis 1 specifically results in two haploid daughter cells. And GOT, that's right. But what you have to remember is that the endomyosis 1, I wonder if I have a diagram up here. Ah, beautiful. So at the end of meiosis one, all right, so here's, we're starting, 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 we're ending, okay? We have a haploid cell. It's haploid because there's no longer a maternal and a paternal chromosome. It's, I was going to say one or the other, but in fact, it's a fusion of both. But as opposed to two sets of chromosomes, there's only one. But at the end of meiosis one, those chromosomes are still doubled. Meiosis two pulls the chromatids apart. So by the time we get to the end, we have four haploid cells. Each consists of a single unduplicated chromosome. So that's the story there. And Emily is asking in what phase we go from diploid to haploid. It's, men it's meiosis one that is responsible for that. And Daniel, I think I got this question. Prior to anaphase one, there is 92 chromosomes in the cell. Nah, I wouldn't say it that way, Daniel. What I would say is that at that moment, there are 92, uh, and the terminology is terrible, chromatids, right? So you see over here, um, like this over here, this is one chromosome consisting of two sister chromatids, okay? So that's what's going on there. So there are 92. Um, so homologous chromosomes are chromosomes that are the same length and staining pattern, GOT, that's right. But not only same length and same staining pattern, they also have the same kind of information. This is really about, this is the, you know how information is a big theme in biology, this is about information. So uh, we got tetrad for real twins, they are like clones indeed. Identical twins are genetic clones of one another. Now, that doesn't mean they're genetically identical, but um, we know about through the process of epigenetics that different genes might be expressed in different ways, even in identical twins, so they're distinct. Um, phenotypic variation is the mechanism by which natural selection acts upon. That is exactly right, GOT. That's fantastic. Matthew's got that. Matthew, good, 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 good. And Regar Arin is saying, hi, sir, I come from France, and that is fabulous. I'm always very happy about all of my French students. It's just very exciting that I can be teaching students from France. And okay, so I think, I think we're good um, with that. Another question here 
is um, so homologous chromosomes code for the same gene but can carry different alleles. Guys, everybody can look at Giotti's uh, comment in the chat right there. That is exactly, exactly right. Okay, so guys, um, I promised that we would do several things and meiosis would be the, just one part of it. So we talk about questions about meiosis and you know, if more come up, I'll address them. Want to remind everybody that we've got a special offer and you can, you can extend this to your friends. Um, $6.99 for the app and um, also discounted access to sciencemusicvideos.com if you don't already have a subscription. Um, and you know, tell a friend if they just email me and they have the word access, I'll give them a discounted price on sciencemusicvideos.com and let's go. All right, so let's do one practice FRQ today. Whenever I get the pandemic blues, I just, I just, I just play this. Produced by Max Cowan. I mean, the beautiful synthesis of music and biology. And for AP Bio Study, what could be better than that? So, guys, um, this is not the kind of thing that you would experience on an FRQ. Let's be really clear. This ain't going to happen to you on May 18th. You're not going to get a question like this. You know, you're going to get a disrupted system. That's what I'm working on a movie about. You're going to get experimental design. That's what I recently produced a movie about. Um, but you could get a question about energy flow where you have to understand the different kinds of ways in which ATP is made. And there are three. There are three different ways. And... Um, uh, I don't know how to really divide you up. There are, I think, just about a dozen of you who are watching this right now. And um, uh, there are three ways in which ATP can be made, three fundamental ways in which ADP can be phosphorylated. All right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at your questions, but while I'm doing that, um, see if you can put these three different ways in the chat and then I'll tell you about them in a minute. And first last, ask about nervous systems and immune systems. And we do not, we do not need to know about the immune system and the nervous system, which I actually think, I mean, it's maybe good for this year when we're all dealing with a pandemic, but those are two of the best systems in biology. And you know, the nervous system leads to issues like consciousness and free will and all the really cool stuff that's in biology, but no, that's not going to be on the test this year. And I dropped the immune system also. Really, body systems are barely, barely in the AP curriculum. In a way, that's good. More is less. I'm a big believer in that. But it's a little, little bit sad, too. So, guys, um, three ways that you can make ATP. And, you know, ATP, it's the molecule. When I go like this, when I move, that's ATP. Um, thinking. ATP, because ATP powers the sodium potassium pump, which pumps ions across the membrane, which makes nerve impulse transmission possible. ATP, it's everything. So I think we got a couple coming in here. Okay. Hey, I like your answer. Emily, I've trained you well. Um, what else? Guys, anybody else? All right. We're going to go right now. We're just going to jump ahead. When you think about AT forma ATP formation, think about what you know about from cellular respiration. So think about the fact that glycolysis creates ATP. How does that happen? Enzymes are creating ATP. When enzymes create ATP, that is called substrate level phosphorylation. Enzymes work on substrates, substrate level phosphorylation. Now at the end of the electron transport chain, there's also a process by which ATP is made, and that's oxidative phosphorylation. And that, it's called that because oxygen is the last electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, and those electrons zip along the electron transport chain. As they do that, their energy is used to pump protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. 
protons accumulate in the intermembrane space, they diffuse through the ATP synthase channel. And as they diffuse through there, kinetic energy is used to enable ATP synthase, which is an enzyme. I mean, it is an enzyme, don't let that confuse you. But this is not substrate level phosphorylation. This is called oxidative phosphorylation because oxygen is acting as the electron acceptor that allows electrons to flow through the electron transport chain, generating a proton gradient. That proton gradient flows through ATP synthase, uses the energy to make ATP. That's oxidative phosphorylation. Now, the last kind is the kind that happens in photosynthesis. It's super similar to what happens in oxidative phosphorylation, except for that oxygen isn't necessary. It's not for oxygen. In fact, it's quite different. It is um, oxygen winds up being released in photosynthesis as opposed to required for photosynthesis. So that's called photophosphorylation. And you guys can just take a minute and read this text right here. Um, I got a little jammed for space. So this is the title. It's listing the three. Some of you wrote that. And go ahead, just take a minute, read that through. I'll read it silently. It's going to be incredibly boring for someone just came to this channel to see that. But that's what we're going to do. Okay, I sped read that. Okay, so um, photophosphorylation, to answer Giotti's question, photophosphorylation in terms of the how it happens is quite similar. Protons get pumped to a sequestered space. In this case, it's the thylakoid space and they flow out from the thylakoid space of the chloroplast back to the stroma. As they flow through, they flow through ATP synthase, and it's the same ATP synthase. Um, I don't think that chloroplast photos ATP synthase is to any degree or, or to, to any large degree different from the kind of ATP synthase that's found in the mitochondria. That's one of the deep, deep evolutionary similarities that brings all of life together. So there we go. Um, so a lot of similarities. The main thing is that you don't need oxygen for photophosphorylation. And here's really the main thing. Oxidative phosphorylation is powered by food. It's powered by the food you eat. Photophosphorylation is powered by light. Okay, so they're powered by different things. And, um, you know, the end products are quite, well, the end product is ATP, but that's it. On average, how many ATPs can be synthesized from substrate level phosphorylation at a time? It's, uh, let's see, it's two per glucose that enters cellular respiration. Yes, I think that's right. You know, of course, if you ever forget anything like that, just play the glycolysis song, okay? So let's go on from this. Um, that was our FRQ review for the day. So people asked to do the Calvin cycle. Um, let's do it. Okay, so right here, um, we've got the two phases of photosynthesis and um, over here we've got the light reaction. So light comes in and what's used as an input, here we go. Um, over here, we've got inputs um, over here that are being produced and made into oxygen, which is the output. And what's the input over here? It's water. Water is the input for the light reactions. It's the matter input. And what happens is that water gets oxidized. And that's pretty easy to remember because it gets oxidized and what results? Oxygen. Where does this happen? This happens in a chloroplast in the thylakoid stacks in the thylakoid, in, in the little thylakoid sac. So now what the light reactions do is oxygen's a waste product. That's not a goal of the process. The goal of the process is to produce high, two highly energetic molecules. So we've got over here ATP. That's what this is being, uh, this sort of uh, starburst is representing over here. And this is 
a cousin of the NADH that we've met in cellular respiration. This is NADPH. This is energy for driving uh, endergonic reactions. This is reducing power. Those feed in to the Calvin cycle, all right? The Calvin cycle takes in carbon dioxide over here and it puts out carbohydrate. So basically what the Calvin cycle does is it reduces carbon dioxide and think about CO2, but think about what comes out over here. C6H12O6 would be glucose. You know, it's a, it's a molecule that has a lot of hydrogen. In biology, really in anything, in any kind of chemistry, things that have a lot of hydrogen have a lot of energy. So this is the Calvin cycle. The waste products of the Calvin cycle are, let's see, the first one would be ADP, NADP+, plus and phosphate, and then those cycle in to the light reaction. So these things cycle back and forth, but we do have an overall output, and the overall output is sugar and oxygen over here. So um, yeah, I'm looking at some of the comments here. And GOT, no, you don't need to know about CAM and C4. That was in the old AP Biology. Um, Water is a source of the electrons, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll actually show you this, guys. Um, let me show you something right here. Um, if you go right here, I'll show you to a section that you might not go to very much, but you see this cell over here, it says four teachers, all right? Click in here. And then it says AP Bio Curriculum Plan Scope and Sequence. No, that's not what you need. You need this, the 2019 course outline. So basically the course outline is this really, really big document over here. And I took it and I made it into a much more digestible thing. So if you want to, like you don't have to by any stretch of the imagination, but if it would be useful to you to do it, what you can do is you can go ahead and you can read over this document. So again, where is it? It's in four teachers, you probably haven't gone there. And then you go back here, I'm gonna go back one level. Four teachers, planning documents, 2019 course outline, and that'll bring this up over here, okay? And you can read through that, you know, it might be useful to you. So, uh, and that's exactly right. If you do a Google search on AP Bio course and exam description, that'll show up as well. So let's go back to what we were doing before. We were talking about the Calvin cycle. And let's go back here. Let's go back here. I'm going to go do this. And I'm going to go back one over here. So we did this. We just reviewed the Calvin cycle. And here's what I'd like to do. Um, I want everybody to look over this diagram and just like see if you could, I want you to do a little mental exercise like A is something, B is something. You don't have to type it in the chat, but what I'd like you to do is um, you um, should go ahead and ask me any questions that you want. So just any questions in the chat about this diagram before I go on, I'm gonna take a quick sip of tea while you do that. And while you do that, I'm going to look at some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. Deuterostomes and protostomes, you do not need to know that at all. Love that stuff. It's about animal biology at a very, very deep level. Deuterostomes and protostomes haven't been on the test since 2012. Gone. Um, intercellular junctions like desmosomes on the test. I would not worry about that. I, I would know that there are intercellular junctions and things can pass. Um, but, but in general, I would not worry about that. Um, yeah, so don't worry about that at all. So guys, any questions about this diagram before we go on? Okay, so let's actually um, do this. Um, I want to just show you something. So here we are, and let's go to my website for a sec. Go up here. So again, if you're ever curious about like what's the best way to review, 
go to the AP College Bio menu, and then go right down here to where it says Photosynthesis. And if you want to form about like the light reactions, this is for you. So this will show you how NADPH is formed. And NADPH is formed at the end of the electron transport that happens in photosynthesis. And basically what it does is um, it uh, basically electron energy that's powered by light flows to an enzyme that takes NADP plus and reduces that NADP plus and makes it into NADPH. So again, here's one of the products of the light reactions, NADPH. Here's the other product of the light reactions, ATP. And of course, as you'll remember, oxygen is just a waste product. So quickly, let's go through the Calvin cycle. All right, so Calvin cycle. All right, Calvin cycle has three overall phases, all right? The first is the carbon fixation phase. The next is the energizing phase. That's where you take what comes in from the carbon fixation phase and you add a lot of energy to it and you pull a little energy out. And then because it's a cycle at the end, you've got to regenerate the starting compound. So that's the big picture. Now, in terms of the details, what do you have to know? All right, so this molecule over here, which is called Rubisco. Rubisco is the most important protein that you've never heard about. It's a hugely important protein because what it can do is it can grab carbon dioxide from the air and it can attach it onto this five carbon molecule, R-U-B-P. And it creates a six carbon molecule that confusingly is not shown in this diagram. Like here, all of these black circles, carbon, 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 and there are five over here, and then there's three over here. Where's the six carbon molecule? This is a molecule that's so unstable, it breaks down immediately. It's never been isolated. No one's ever been able to hold up a flask and say, oh, this is the result of carbon fixation. That's because no one's ever been able to do that. It immediately falls apart into two, three carbon molecules. And so, and that molecule has its third carbon is the product of carbon fixation. And this is an amazing thing what I have my students do. Grab your arm like this, okay? Feel how solid it is, how dense it is. All of those carbon molecules, all right, you know, it's mostly carbon, the ones floating around in the air, they were completely diffuse. And this is really the miracle of carbon dioxide. Of course, it's not a miracle because it evolved, but the idea is that this came about through carbon fixation, through Rubisco grabbing carbon dioxide out of the air and attaching it to an organic compound over here. Now, in the next phase, this three carbon compound gets phosphorylated correlated. You see that ATP is becoming ADP? Well, that phosphate is going onto this molecule. That's changing the bond energy in that molecule. And then you see over here, NADPH is becoming NADP+. That is an oxidation of NADPH to NADP+. And as this is becoming oxidized, this molecule is becoming reduced to another molecule. Now, in biology, really in anything, Reduction is a gain of energy. That sounds a little counterintuitive. What's being reduced is the oxidation number, but the main thing is reductions gain energy. What's reduced? Gasoline is reduced. Now that's not a food. Peanut butter is reduced and apple is reduced. Those are all highly reduced compounds. What's oxidized? Ash is completely oxidized. Carbon dioxide is oxidized. Reduce things are fuels. Oxidized things are pretty useless for the most part. So, um, Basically, what we have over here is this molecule over here, um, G3P, and G3P is what gets pulled out of the Calvin cycle, and that gets used to create glucose, wood, cotton. You know, this is really like the foundational reaction of life. Like, it creates food, it creates sugar, it creates everything. All the food that you eat ultimately came from this harvest of energy over here. And then finally, now we have this three carbon molecule. What we've got to do is we've got to boost it up to five carbons and that's it. So that is the incredible carbon uh, Calvin cycle. I'm gonna move myself over here. Um, this other side, no, over here. Beautiful, okay. 
So now I'm in the right spot. So guys, in the chat, questions, questions, anything about wavelengths and all that jazz. Andrew, I want to encourage you to uh, do my light reactions tutorial on sciencemusicvideos.com and here it is and you'll learn everything you'll need to know. In fact, I have one that precedes this, which um, talks about um, photo excitation, photo systems. That's the one that you need. Um, it'll get you everything that you need to know. So go ahead, do that. Um, I don't think you need to worry about it very much though, really, for the AP exam. And again, it's really hard to know what's gonna be on this AP exam, but that's just the way it is for this year. Okay, so um, that's the Calvin cycle. That was the thing that you guys wanted me to review about. Um, so, um, questions about the Calvin cycle. Can I, can I answer any, any possible questions about the Calvin cycle? Anything that people are curious about? Anything that people want to know about? Any questions about the Calvin cycle? I'm going to go back over here so you can see it. There you go. So questions about the Calvin cycle, any of these reactions, about the reductions, the oxidations, you know, what, what do you need to know to understand how this process works? Okay. All right, so I think, I think we're good. And um, okay, non-cyclic electron flow. Non-cyclic electron flow is this, all right? So I'm gonna jump over here. Um, this is non-cyclic electron flow. So when light powers photosystem two, which boosts electrons, which ultimately come from water, sends them on an electron transport chain. That electron transport chain is used to pump protons so you can make ATP. And then the other photosystem um, boosts the electrons again so you can take NADP+, reduce it and make NADPH. That's non-cyclic electron flow. And it's non-cyclic because it's not a cycle. It's linear. It starts over here and you can follow the pathway of an electron all the way through, non-cyclic. Now, cyclic electron flow is a system that um, exists on its own in certain bacteria, and it shows up in um, eukaryotic chlorophyll-based uh, photosynthesis, or chloroplast-based photosynthesis. Whenever there's an excess of NADP+, plus, excuse me, NADPH, and the cell needs to sort of fill the gap and make more ATP, all right, and then it'll just do cyclic flow. And basically, it's just photosystem one. Electrons get boosted. They um, are used to power an electron transport chain, which is used to pump protons to make ATP. So you'll see that this system, cyclic electron flow, just makes ATP, all right? That's cyclic electron flow. Non-cyclic, ATP and NADPH. Cyclic is just ATP, excellent. So um, Emily is asking a question about the Calvin cycle. And let me see this question. So a total of six. Oh, Emily, I um, don't think you need to worry about that. I don't even know if I can answer that question, frankly, about like keeping track of the number of NADPHs that are produced because it's a function of a lot of things that are not strictly uh, digital. They're much more analog. So like, for example, the intensity of light um, I think the main thing to hold on to um, is that um, the light reactions are making NADPH, and it's a reduction of NADP+, and that's really all you have to know. And then first, last is asking me, if you have cyclic flow, what is the point of cellular respiration? There's a couple of things going on. First of all, animals don't have chloroplasts, right? So animals have to make ATP by... Um, you know, they're, they're, the mitochondria uh, sort of split from the chloroplast a long time ago. So, you know, cellular respiration is just like it's a separate parallel thing. Um, 
plants are using their ATP not to power their cellular processes. This is kind of a weird and very fundamental thing. ATP doesn't get transferred between cells and the chloroplast is kind of a cell. So the chloroplast uses its ATP to do whatever it does, you know, to reproduce itself, to grow. And as a favor to the plant that it lives in, the chloroplast is using the light reactions to make ATP. But the chloroplast doesn't give ATP to the plant cell. What the chloroplast gives to the plant cell is sugar. And then this is crazy, but then the plant cell uses sugar to make ATP to power its own processes. It, it uses sugar to do cellular respiration. So that is a really fundamental thing. Every cell makes its own ATP. Nobody shares ATP. ATP is like every cell's on its own in terms of ATP production. Um, so first, last, I hope that helps, right? Um, if you have cyclic flow, so, so I hope that cleared things up. It's a very, very weird thing about biology, but like you don't eat AD, ATP, you're, you eat food, and then your cells make ATP. Hey, doing a little time check. It's getting a little bit late. Guys, we're going to jump a little bit. And we're going to jump to our... Biology quiz. I always get much too ambitious for these. Okay, quiz time. All right, everybody ready? Like this? Okay, I'm gonna type some words into the chat. All right, this question, it's two words. Okay. This is like a big jump, but this is what you got to be ready for at this part of the year. G protein linked receptors are a family of membrane receptors that bind with length from outside the cell. Binding activates a G protein, which activates blank, blank, blank inside the cell. What's that first blank? Put a semicolon. What's the next three blanks? It's Jeopardy time. See if you can answer these questions. Holy cow. Hey, that was so fast. And that exactly is the answer. Ligands, signal transduction pathways. That's what reception, cell communication, it's all about stuff like that. Okay, let's go on to our next question. All right. Beautiful. Fermentation, organisms take pyruvate and oxidize it in order to regenerate NADP, NAD+, so that cells continue to use blank to create ATP. What process? What process? Let's go. Let's see something. Process that fills in that blank. Good, 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 good. But hey, think of a process, not you're thinking of a molecule. Think of a process. How's that glucose being processed? And hey, way to go. Daniel, fantastic. Let's see a couple more answers. All right, way to go. Another one. You guys are the best. Here's our answer. Woo! Okay, functions of mitosis. We talked about meiosis in our video today. Function of mitosis include repair of damaged tissue, blank, and asexual reproduction. Three, three functions of mitosis. Hey, that's good enough. Development's close enough because development is closely allied with growth. Excellent. Fantastic. You guys are all such biomanians. 
Okay, guys, in phosphorylation cascades, a series of protein blanks add a phosphate group to the next protein in the cascade sequence. What is in that blank? Holy cow. We got the answers flowing in, flowing in like a mighty stream. Let's get one or two more. Hmm. Interesting. Very, very good. I think we got one more. Hmm. Um... I think you can answer this in a couple of ways. During crossing over, which occur during crossing over, which occurs during meiosis, chromatids from homologous chromosomes exchange segments of DNA. This increases genetic variation in the resulting blank produced by meiosis. So what gets produced by meiosis? What gets produced by meiosis? Oh, sorry, sorry, guys. Fantastic. All right, are we the last one? Let's see. Gametes. All right, there is no time for more FRQs from Biomania, but that doesn't mean that you can't do this. You can't go here and you can't go to here and you can go to here and click FRQ review and do more FRQs. Guys, our hour is up. This has been fantastic. I'll be back with you on Tuesday. We're going to be at two weeks before the AP exam. I totally want to encourage you to hit Biomania hard. And if you've got friends who aren't hitting Biomania hard, then I want you to go ahead and uh, encourage them to download the app and see what they can do to improve their ability to handle the FRQs. Guys, um, GOT, GOT, I'm not going to be able to do that, but GOT, what I want to encourage you to do is this. So GOT, go here, hit AP Bio, AP College Bio, and I, I kind of, like, I overdid gene regulation, but if you go right here, you see this? eukaryotic gene regulation and expression oh my goodness i take you through the whole thing i got you i got you through this whole process of euchromatin and heterochromatin and believe me if you do this you're going to be set um so guys take it easy it's been fantastic i'll see you tuesday encourage your friends to come to the next one this has been awesome see you next week mr w signing off. Good night. Take it easy. Be well.